Men of our age generally don't think symbolically. We don't have poetic imaginations. And because of this, we don't think that clothing is important. We don't think that clothing, at the very least, communicates anything. But everything communicates something. The world that God made is a world that speaks. And the world we make as sub-creators also speaks. And just because we don't think poetically doesn't mean that we are not communicating. If you look at what people wear in our culture, they communicate several things. There's lots of things that you could gather if you looked at general trends of what people are wearing. Mindless individualism, disrespect, laziness, and above all, the God of the entire thing is comfort. The CEOs of tech companies wear t-shirts and flip-flops, just like sophomores at a university. The president of the United States now generally sometimes doesn't even wear a tie, right? We are this casual, democratized people, and this manifests in the clothes that we wear. Scripture gives a lot of attention to clothing. If we went through Scripture and we looked at every time the, the Bible mentions clothing, uh, we could develop a theology of clothes, and we're going to kind of do that today a little bit, a theology of vestments. I first began thinking about this in the Marine Corps, where Marines are known for their dress blues. It's a very sharp uniform, and it's worn during ceremonial uh, events for Marines, and it communicates the valor and the, and the nobleness of the warrior. It is clearly communicated and conveyed um, through uh, that, that dress. And then in the day-to-day -day work of the Marine, they are wearing camis or camouflage or, or fatigues. And these communicate uh, hard work. Sometimes they get sweaty, they get dirty, they get torn. And these communicate training, they communicate being on duty, or they communicate being at war. The, these things are all communicated with those kinds of things. So clothes matter, they communicate. The Latin word for clothing is uh, vestimentum which is where we get the word vestments from. And uh, the word uh, vestments, I think, also has this correlation to authority and ownership, which is what um, we're going to get in today. But if you think about someone is vested with authority, we don't even make that association that it's a reference to clothes. Someone's vested with authority. Or someone may have a vested interest in the estate of, of some property or something like this. And there's there's ownership, there's authority involved here with, um, with clothing. And we see this in, in the world that we live in. A judge enters a courtroom wearing a black robe. That's the one who is the highest authority in that courtroom. Policeman wears his uniform and his badge. That guy has the ability, the authority, to uh, exercise lethal force in order to keep the peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, we also have doctors who wear white white coats and they have a stethoscope. That's a doctor. That's somebody who has authority. They have the knowledge of how to heal bodies. At least they're supposed to. Doctors today are complete morons, but they used to. A priest wears a white robe and it communicates a messenger from heaven. That's what the messengers of heaven wear, are white robes. And here in our passage, we are told that Joseph is given a tunic of many colors. Why are we told this? We're told this because it signifies two things, sacrifice and authority. That's it. That's what this tunic means. That's what this robe of many colors means. Sacrifice and authority. Okay. How exactly does it do this? Well, if we go back to the garden, that's the first time we see clothes in Scripture. The first time we see clothes is after the fall. It's one of the problems of the fall. Adam and Eve are naked, and they're afraid. They know that they're naked, and they're afraid because they're naked. So we have this problem of needing to cover our nakedness. And what do they do? They sow fig leaves for themselves. It's this kind of uh, self-salvation. But what does God do? God clothes them. He clothes them with animal skins, with tunics. It's the same word that's used here in, Joseph, in the Joseph passage. Tunics of skin. And, what, and what, is, what does that mean? It means that God sacrificed animals to clothe them. 
So the covering of their sin required sacrifice, and these are, they're wearing these sacrifices on their bodies as covering of their sin. So vestments represent sacrifice. They represent the forgiveness of sin. That the word uh, that God, it says, God made tunics of skin and clothed them. That word clothed, lavesh, means to put on. And uh, it carries over into the Greek, and it has a similar kind of meaning. Often when you read in Scripture to put on something, you could just as easily say clothe. You clothe yourself in something. So God makes their nakedness disappear through sacrifice and covering them uh, with these vestments. And it's twofold in the way that uh, the, 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 what it communicates is if they're walking around these, these animal skins, what do they look like? They look like animals. They look like what they worshiped. They listened to an animal, and now they are an animal. And so it's a form of shame, but it also anticipates a form of glory. There's this redemption that is anticipated. We see this with Joseph, and we see this as uh, we go uh, forward. So the Heavenly Father sacrifices animals in order to cover the sins of his children. And I think... Uh, <laughs> we start to see that this covering starts to become a more glorious thing with Joseph. And I cannot help but to wonder if this is a tradition that was passed down from Adam, this is speculation, but passed down from Adam through Noah, all the way down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where the heavenly father closed his son, he clothed his son, Adam. And I wonder if there was some kind of tradition of the father clothing the son of the covenant. And that's what he's doing with Joseph. He's clothing his favored son. I don't know, um, but I, 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 that came to mind as I was uh, uh, looking at this. So uh, the, the, the tunic represents a covering of sin, a covering of sin that requires sacrifice. That's, that's one of the first things. And we see the sacrificial aspect expanded on and um, visited again uh, with Jacob. Jake, what does Jacob do? Jacob puts on a tunic of Esau's skin in order to get a blessing from the father. He appears before the perfect, he is the perfect man. Jacob is called the perfect man. And he appears before the father as the sinful man. He's draped in Esau's skin, essentially. And that's how the father sees him and he blesses him. The clothes communicate sacrifice in this moment is a figure of Calvary. There are sacrificial elements involved here. Isaac, we're told Isaac smelled the smell of his clothing and it pleased him. And this is the language that we see of God when sacrifices are made that are pleasing to him. He smells it. He smells the aroma of the sacrifice. He smells the incense and it pleases him. In Exodus, we also have the sacrificial aspect visited again with the priests, but then we start to see more glory added uh, to this. Things are, are, are expanded upon. The priests are given tunics, we're told, explicitly for glory and beauty. So tunics are not only a covering for sin, salvation, but now we start to see something added to it, beauty and glory, something superfluous. Beauty is unnecessary, has no utilitarian value, but God required it of his priests. If we read the section of Exodus that deals with this, we see the garments of the priests are also, they're, they're to cover their nakedness. The tunic covers their nakedness. I'll read this real, real quickly. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics and you shall make sashes for them and you shall make hats for them for glory and for beauty. So you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him. And notice he's, Moses is putting them on Aaron. He's being vested by somebody else. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near to the altar to minister in the holy place that they do not incur iniquity and die. So we have this covering as a form of salvation. You cannot approach God in your nakedness. That has to be covered. And that's what the priests are wearing here. So these vestments have this covering of sin aspect visited, and then it's added upon with this glory and beauty aspect as well. 
If we look at Joseph's story, uh, we see his investments are, are beginning to signify authority and rule. And this is not disconnected with sacrifice. Because every time Joseph is sacrificed, figuratively, he resurrects and he gains more authority. That's the repetition of Joseph's story. It happens three times. Well, it happens twice. It happens twice, excuse me. Well, maybe three, maybe three. Joseph is given a tunic of many colors by his father. And um, he's, it says that he's out there with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, and he comes back with this bad report. Um, and you read that, it's like, well, why wasn't he out there with the sons of Leah? It could be, this is speculation, some have speculated, that he was given authority to basically be an overseer over the concubine sons. And, and this uh, uh, robe kind of signified that authority. That's speculation, we don't know that. Um, but it's possible. But what we do know is that Joseph is sacrificed by his brothers. Joseph is a type of sacrificial animal. They skin the Joseph lamb. They remove his tunic, they put blood on it. And he goes down to death, he goes down into the pit. But then he comes out of the pit and he's elevated to the overseer of Potiphar's house. He's given authority over all of Potiphar's house. So Joseph's sacrifice uh, results in elevation, in authority, in enthronement. And Joseph receives a new tunic. We're not told this, but um, likely Potiphar gave him a new tunic. He has a new garment that again is removed by Potiphar's wife. He's sacrificed again. He's skinned again. The Joseph lamb is skinned by Potiphar's wife. She removes his garment and he's naked and he flees. So Joseph, again, he dies again and he goes into the pit and he's in the pit for two years, this prison pit. And then he comes back from the dead and Pharaoh gives him authority over all of Egypt. And Pharaoh literally vests him with vestments. So Joseph's death results in dominion. Sacrifice results in authority. Uh, we, had, we had been talking about signets. Uh, uh, Pharaoh gives him a signet. He takes off his signet ring and he puts it on, uh, on Joseph. And then we read in Genesis 41, 42, um, uh, actually, we, and we had just been, wa we watched the Prince of Egypt and the same thing happened. <laughs> Ramses gives uh, Moses the signet ring. And so I wonder if they were carrying that on uh, from this story. But um, when, we read in, uh, when we read of Joseph's elevation in Genesis 41, 42, it says, Pharaoh, he clothed him, Joseph, in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. So he put on him a covering of fine linen, uh, a sh a shesh is the Hebrew word, which is the same word that's used of the priestly garments, this fine linen. So Joseph is this priest king. And what we talked about last week, he's this prophet. He's a prophet, he's a priest, he's a king. So we have the sacrificial aspect, which results in vested authority. Very uh, strongly typological of Christ and this actually happens with Jesus. When he's at the cross, Jesus's tunic is stripped of him. It's removed. His garments are taken off of him. Soldiers cast lots for it. And they, it fulfills Psalm 22. And John tells us several times that it's a tunic that was seamless. And uh, uh, the garment of the priest is to be a seamless um, garment so that it doesn't tear. And John tells us many times that it, doesn't, it didn't tear. They didn't tear that tunic. So John is suggesting strongly, he's telling us, this is a priest. Here's a priest who is not only the sacrificer, but he is the sacrificial animal as well. And in Revelation, so yeah, so in, in Revelation, we have the return of the king. So he dies, his garments are stripped, but then he comes back with garments in Revelation, the return of the king. We could call John's apocalypse the return of the king. And just like Joseph, he has a robe, he has a tunic that's dipped in blood, but now he's a king that's coming back for blood. He's a king that's coming back with authority. In Revelation 19, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. 
So jo Jesus is the archetype of Joseph's type. Uh, Joseph's tunic is popularly thought of as a coat of many colors, and for good reason. That's what we read in our translation. But it's not what uh, the Hebrew says. It doesn't have anything about colors uh, in, in the Hebrew. Um, the Hebrew says something more like it was a flat-palmed tunic, which is just this kind of weird phrase. But likely most commentators think it's, it's something like a tunic that comes down to the, to the hand, to the palm. Um, so it's, it's a long-sleeved tunic. The Septuagint says that it was a pluriform tunic or a manifold tunic. It was a, a variegated tunic. So they, again, there, there's not colors mentioned, but it says that it was many, a many tunic. And it's translated often as a coat of many colors. And so if indeed this coat is a coat of many colors, I think that's fine. I, I often prefer the Septuagint rendering of a lot of these things. But uh, if it is that, uh, what does a, a many colored coat look like? What does it look like he's wearing, if that's the case? What do, a rainbow, right. It's a rainbow. Looks like he's wearing a rainbow. Where do we see rainbows in scripture? Any of the kids? Genesis. Genesis, where? That's right, right. And what does that signify? Uh, a promise. Yes, a promise. Yes, right. A, a rainbow for, for Noah, signif the Noahic covenant, signifies God's mercy. God's mercy on humanity. Where else do we see rainbows? There's two other places that they figure prominently. And they're both kind of similar. Anybody know? That's right, yeah. Ezekiel sees into heaven, he sees the throne of God, and God is surrounded by a rainbow. We could say God is, is wearing a rainbow. Um, in Ezekiel 128, we read this, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So we have this rainbow around the throne, and then... Where's the second place we see this? And uh, Revelation. Yeah, right. In Revelation, it's very similar. Uh, Revelation has so much Ezekiel kind of uh, aspects in it. Um, but yeah, we see uh, John in his apocalypse. Uh, we read this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like jasp like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald around the throne were 24 thrones and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So we see that God is clothed in uh, rainbows, or we, we could say that he's clothed in a rainbow. Also, what's surrounding the altar, it says there's a rainbow surrounding the throne, and then there's elders surrounding the throne. And so there's kind of this conflation of the elders and, and rainbow. Um, we might say that God, God, if we think of Revelation, we think of Joseph and this rainbow elder aspect. Uh, in, in Revelation, God is... We'll start with Joseph. In, with Joseph's story, Joseph is clothed with God. And in Revelation, God is clothed with us. It's this weird, scandalous thing. But that's, I think, the trajectory of Scripture. And we start to see that. Um, and then I think we can also think with the Noahic covenant, with the rainbows in, over the earth, that God is clothing the earth in himself. Yeah. <clears throat> Say again. Joseph becomes a priest and king. He has the rainbow garments. Yeah. And then Jesus comes as a priest king. Right. He's clothed rainbow. And then Revelation, the elders that are the clothed rainbow sing, you have made us priest and king. Ah, very good. I like it. That's awesome. Very true. Amen. And um, one of the things that th then this gets to, to build on that. Um, what God is doing with us is we see that uh, this, this robe of many colors um, is, is applied to queenly vestments. We start to see queens and royal women appareled similarly to Joseph. Um, and of course, this typo typology here is very strong of what? 
what would that be indicative of? What, are, what is a royal woman? What, what is the archetype of the royal woman? The church, right. The church is the royal woman. And the only other place, this, this phrase of um, uh, uh, Joseph's um, colored coat, it's only in one other place. And that is in 2 Samuel 13, 18, where we're told that the virgin daughters of King David wear these coats of many colors, although it's not translated that way. I think it's, um, let's see here, uh, I, I have this. Uh, okay, and then Tamar, Tamar is wearing, she's wearing um, one of these coats and she tears it after she's raped. Um, and so I've thought about this, this is kind of a difficult thing and I, I want just thinking about this typologically, I wonder if this has to do with the church being persecuted or the church being violated um, in a sense. And uh, I don't know, but that's something that kind of came to mind. That's something that I'd be, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on. But uh, we read this. Now she, Tamar, was wearing a long robe with sleeves, and thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. So this is this, the long robe with sleeves is the same Hebrew phrase, identical to Joseph's coat of many colors. <coughs> We see a similar thing in Psalm 45. We see royal women wearing uh, uh, these robes of many colors. Psalm 45 is about the kingly Messiah and his bride. And we read this. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. And as we've already mentioned, uh, Joseph's clothes are the clothing of, of God. God is clothing Joseph in himself. And we see this exactly in Ezekiel, which is interesting because Ezekiel is the one who sees God clothed in uh, the rainbow. I want to read this passage because this, uh, this shows God clothing Israel, his wife, in himself. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. God is spreading his garment over her nakedness. Sometimes that's translated as wing. I put my wing over you. But I think that that detracts from what's, I mean, in some ways you could, it looks like I have wings. You could say that garments are kinds of wings. So you can kind of see that kind of uh, linguistic association, but it makes more sense with the, the corner of the garment. So I will cover your nakedness with the corner of my garment. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine. This marriage language, this covenantal language, says the Lord God, then I washed you in water, baptismal language. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood and I anointed you with oil. Christ is the anointed one. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. He's, he, now he's giving her extra clothing, extra apparel, more glorious types of apparel. I clothed you with fine linen. There's that fine linen aspect. And covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and, and a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Doesn't God know what Paul said about women being modest? God is lavishing her. He is lavishing her with beauty and ornamentation. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen, silk and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey and oil. The bride of Christ does not abide by dietary fads that we have today. She is eating her carbs. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty. For it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed on you, says Lord God. What does this remind you of? The bride of Christ in Revelation, also given fine linen. 
When God redeems his people, he not only saves them from their sin by covering their nakedness, but he beautifies them. He gives them a glory. He gives them extra. God is not a utilitarian God. He lavishes. He puts on more. He goes above and beyond. And this is what we start to see with uh, this theology of vestments, this theology of covering. If God was a utilitarian God, if he was an Anabaptist God, he would simply just cover you with a tunic and be like, that's good. But that's not what he does. He covers you with the tunic, and then he gives you another robe, and a fine linen, and a diadem, and ornaments, and earrings, and all of these other things. God lavishes. And this is also seen with the new covenant Israel, with the bride of Christ. In John's apocalypse, we read, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And the Greek word there for fine linen, if we look at the Septuagint, is the same word used for when Pharaoh gives that fine linen robe to Joseph. So we start to see this conflation of the kingly vestments, the queenly vestments. And Job makes a similar comparison where it says these fine linens are the righteousness of the saints. Job says something similar. He says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. And I think the theological import of this is that the righteous acts of the saints are given to them by God. They're not inherent to ourselves. If the linen is given to, God, given to us by God and the linen is our, right, our righteous acts, well, then our righteous acts are given to us by God. They don't originate within us. God gives them to us. It's a, it's a visual statement of God's unilateral, monergistic grace on us. And that righteousness is given to us only in Christ, and, and this, is, this is where I will end. Many times in the New Testament, we see the word put on Christ, or we see something like this. And I think that that, fra that phrase is fine to put on Christ, put on love, but a way that it can be rendered, it can also be rendered legitimately as clothe yourself in Christ. And I think given the, the, um, what the Bible is telling us about clothing, I think that that would be a better way. And some versions do do this. The New American Standard does do this at, at times. And Paul says to the Romans, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ or clothe yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Elsewhere, Paul says that we, in baptism, we are clothed in Christ, but here he's saying, put on Christ. So there is this, you are clothed in Christ, so clothe yourself in Christ. Paul says similar things to the Colossians. But now you yourselves are to take off all these things. It's as if they're clothing. Take off anger, take it off. Take off wrath, take it off. Take off malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have taken off the old man with his deeds and have clothed yourself with the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves in tender mercies, clothe yourselves in kindness, clothe yourselves in humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, Clothe yourselves in love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. It's this constant clothing language, and it's obscured because it's generally rendered put on. But I, I, I really love that the trajectory of Scripture, and we get to the New Testament, and it's like, 
You're clothed in Christ. Put on Christ. Clothe yourself in him. Clothe clothe yourself in love. Paul says the same thing in Ephesians 4.23. Paul just says, take off the old man and clothe yourself in the new man. And some modern translations of this are really abysmal. They'll say, um, put off your old self and put on the new self which completely loses the the biblical import of the old man and the new man. It's more kind of a psychological, uh, modern kind of jargon that that it's uh, saying. And that's not what the Greek says. The Greek says anthropos. It has man in there, not self. All right. Joseph's tunic of many colors is about sacrifice and authority. And it's specifically about Christ's sacrifice and his enthronement in heaven. Vestments are shown to us in scripture to signify the forgiveness of sins and the authority that comes through sacrifice and the glory and beauty that is given to the church in the righteousness uh, uh, of the saints who are clothed in Christ. Let's pray. The charge is this. Don't walk around naked. Don't cover yourself with fig leaves Rather, clothe yourself, cover yourself with Christ. Paul says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have been clothed in Christ. You are clothed in Christ, so clothe yourself in Christ. Take off the first Adam and clothe yourself in the second Adam. Clothe yourself in God. Go get sacrificed, resurrect, and take dominion. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.